Jason. Oh, <laughs> and welcome Hello. to our October 21st Telecom West. My name is <laughs> We did it. We made it. Thank you. Telecom West is a live reading series that brings published local writers to read alongside community members in an open, uncensored forum. In order to promote the voice of every community member in democratic ideals, we honor all levels of skill, ability, and craft. In addition to featuring published authors to give the literary arts more exposure in Cache Valley and its surrounding areas, we invite and celebrate aspiring writers from every walk of life to find and share their voices with us. We are committed to the causes of inclusion, accessibility, and representation in our writing community. I would like to thank our sponsors, the Bear River Heritage Area, the Logan Library, Sugar House Review, the Utah Humanities, uh, the Utah Teen Poetry Festival today, and mm -hmm. of course our founder, Star Holbrook. <laughs> and our cute new glasses. If you would like to read during the open mic, uh, for those who walked in late, it is sitting up here. We can get it circulating again as well. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Also, please help yourself to coffee. After our featured reader tonight, we'll go down the list as far as time permits. Each reader has up to seven minutes to read for us, and after seven minutes, you'll be politely clapped off. All of our Peloton West events. <laughs> no booing, no like dragging the poetry. I might go far. All of our Peloton West events are recorded back here and then posted to our Peloton West YouTube channel. So if you do not wish to be recorded but would still like to read, just make a little note for the little star by your name on the list so we can get the camera turned off. Okay, so our reader tonight, we have Shannon Ballum. She is the Poet Laureate for the city of Logan, Utah. Her newest poetry collection, Inside the Animal, the collected Red Riding Hood poems, is a semi-finalist for the 2017 Trio House Press Luis Bogan Award and a finalist for the 2017 Hillary... <laughs> poetry book competition from Inlandia Press and was published by Main Street Rag in June 2019. She is also a senior lecturer for the Utah State University English Department where she teaches poetry writing and composition. She is also the internship coordinator and the poetry faculty advisor for St. Hollow, an undergraduate literary magazine. Shannon was named the 2014 Lecturer of the Year for the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. She's got tons of awards, tons of beautiful, wonderful experience and poems out. Mm -hmm. Check out her website, shannonbellum.org, and welcome her to the floor. <laughs> I love reading it. 
I guess I should explain what this book is about for those of you who don't know. Um, so I wrote um, Red Riding Hood poems. Uh, originally started writing Red Riding Hood poems because I was trying to write about some very difficult emotional situations in my personal life. And um, just writing about those cold, they just became rants and they weren't, they weren't um, poems. And so um, I was advised by a mentor to try to use some kind of a, a boundary to sort of protect myself or a persona um, in order to write about these emotionally charged situations. And so it occurred to me that the uh, situation I was writing about at the time was my sister and her domestic violence situation. And um, it occurred to me that uh, I could use the persona of Red Riding Hood to speak, speak about that. Um, okay, so the first poem is Red Riding Hood Opens the Door. There is a house. Inside the house, a wolf. Inside the wolf, an old woman. Inside the old woman, an empty womb, glittering music, teeth, hair, fists, bold of brain, blooming intricate. Inside the wolf, inside the woman, there is a deep metal fear of bodies shattering into fragments, shimmering back into syntax. Meanwhile, the old woman's daughter packs a basket, dresses her daughter in a red cape, directs her into a green-black forest where there is no God, only a story, wild roses always breathing soft warnings. She reaches the house, opens the door, a dark mouth opens, and she knows again the dazzling pain of self in all its forms, our disastrous needs. The story is so heavy. Inside a small house, a wolf weeps. The womb aches. Um, let's see. Do you guys have any that you want me to read? I know you guys have heard lots of these, and so it's kind of like, yeah. I, I haven't. I haven't okay. heard hardly any of them. I've read a couple of them. I just feel like you did. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll just go with it. Just go with it. Just, just read as many as you can. Yeah. Okay. You know, and make it a sense of familiarity with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, one thing I wanted to do was instead of, I, I wrote in three different voices Red Riding Hood, The Grandmother, and The Wolf. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to do was make sure that I wasn't just following the script of Red Riding Hood and that Wolf was always going to be a predator. And so um, this poem is um, takes a little bit different look at the wolf. And this is called Wolf Wears Red Riding Hood's Cape. When the story is silent behind its hard covers, Wolf slips into the cape, becomes a mind of clean wind. His clumsy paws arrange delicate shawls around grandmother's shoulders. Gently, he combs her thin hair. A wonderful sadness washes through him when he wanders in fields glistening bluebells, their heads bowed in reverence. He hears their soft prayers. For hours, he labors with a paintbrush, watercolors, paints sunsets for grandmother, orange, purple, gold, he fastens his pictures high on her wall. He floats in a cold river, opens his eyes underwater, feels the pure ecstasy of distortion. He sleeps next to grandmother. In the dark, she tells him of baby Moses adrift in his tiny ark. Um, so in that poem, there's the reference to the grandmother, um, and the grandmother in my book is my grandmother, and everything that I, I write in here kind of reimagines her life and um, what she might have wished for. And um, she was also uh, she was she was a beautiful seamstress. I don't know what the word would be, but she could sew these beautiful dresses, um, curtains, uh, she crocheted tablecloths, just all kinds of beautiful things. Um, and when I was about five or six, she 
amazing this dress um, with this beautiful embroidery across the breast that was a fountain of flowers. And so th this poem recalls that, but it's, it's told in the voice of Red Riding Hood's grandmother. The dress. If I dress myself in darkness, if across my face I draw a black lace veil, if for my granddaughter, granddaughter I sew a dress, a white dress, with hyacinth and crocus embroidered across the bodice, if I fasten a strong satin ribbon to tie around her waist, if down the back I fix glistening pearl buttons, God, oh my God, allow her to become another girl, one who will glide like an angel past evil, past danger, arriving always at my gate. Silvery lupins, blue pentamens, throats open, drinking bees. In the shade, damp grass flattens the oval of an animal body. Once, washing walls, behind the bookshelf I found the faint footprint of a girl, angled as if she were lying down, gazing out the window into thin rags of rain. Tenderly, I cleansed her toes away. I remember bathing her body in the steaming basin, my cloth dripping pale perfume. It must be so lonely to be the fading print, the fragrant indentation laced with mud. I lie down so it can hold me, this cradle of long, fine grass. One of the first Red Riding Hood poems I wrote um, and um, this was one of those really emotionally charged poems where I felt like I was basically, I was being victimized by my um, now ex-brother-in-law. Mm. Um, and he was, he was just an evil person. Mm. <laughs> so um, this is called Red Riding Hood in the Forest, told through Red Riding Hood's voice, thinking about the wolf. I saw him curling animal around every bend, so I slunk and pressed my robes to rocks damp with mosses, wishing, oh, wishing to peel off my skin. Animal, he wants me around every bend. Once I gazed at him, my eyes dark and damp. I unlatched my cloak, pressed to him whole. At first he curled gentle, leaned me, bent me, then his teeth clenched my throat. I tasted gray snow. Then he curled, sucked me, bent and cracked my spine. I sunk into a mind of damp and dark mosses. I changed my path. I burned my road. But still around every bend I see him curling. So I've stopped washing my hair. Don't smear color on my lips. Learn to stop, walk stiff with no swing in my hips. I clench my cloak tight, cover my dark secret places. I can't find a zipper to zip up this skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. More. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is one I wanted to read. Um, so, as many of you know, my younger brother uh, died um, eight years ago. Um, and there, I can't remember when it was.
Um, and that I felt like I had to like face this death, it was kind of a facing of my brother's death in a way. Um, I chose to also put this one in from the voice of the grandmother. Um, it also contains a, a, a real dream that I had. So I know those are kind of convoluted, but it's interesting to think of where a poem, how a poem was born. Um, this is Grandmother Dreams of the Owls. Where the narrow canyon opens to deep snow meadow, the fawn lies dead, muzzle softened with frost. A wolf has taken one hind leg, exposing bright muscle, white bone, and I do not turn from blood-soaked snow, flap of skin with its yellow sap, clumps of hair hanging in the maple. I open my eyes wide, try to see into the dark, for in my dreams owls call to me, owls that live in a great maple beside the empty train station. So many perch that the tree is a torch of gold eyes, absorbing all darkness, exposing me waiting alone on the cold bench, suitcase at my feet. Tonight I will board the train that arrives with no conductor from distant dark, the train that departs into a darkness so deep only owls can travel there, owls, messengers from the other world who will teach me to vanish, reappear, and leave the dead over the threshold tenderly. In the meadows of death, I have seen the fawn bend hungry mouth to emerald grass already. All right, two more. So the grandmother foresees her own death, um, and a lot of this is foreshadowing of the wolf coming in the book, and the, the sequence goes basically through that narrative. And so this is near, nearing the end of the book, and this is Grandmother Sees Wolf in the Garden. Through the window, a shadow, open mouthed, darkens my poppies with its violet fur, its blood-slick fangs. Oh, grave and disastrous animal marking my garden. How would it feel to have such a fine nose, wet sensitive to the rush of scent, musky wings, fine fur musk, sweet spray of urine on willow? How would it feel to have such ears, triangles pricked to their slightest kick, rabbits passing in tall grasses? To have such eyes, pupils dilated to drink rodents pouring from hole to hole? How would it feel to be driven by hunger, to never question your needs? How would it feel to know nothing of God and to eat, oh to feast, in blue moonlight to strike such delicious innocence and fleece, to scrape tooth against bone, drink the white leaf of marrow, all its salty stars. Mm. All right, and the last one, the wolf, of course, has eaten the grandmother, but this is what happens to my grandmother. <laughs> grandmother inside the wolf. She is all glitter, sinew, his thudding heart, her metronome. She whirls, weightless, turning and turning in the gauze of the giddy. She is a hummingbird inside a glass cage, feathers thrumming pink and green, smearing his insides with the bright sugar of survival until Wolf's mind is a wild white whirring. Dizzy, he sweats and wretches. There is no stopping her twirling, thinking, this is love. Oh, there's no turning back the ecstatic clock. Can you add my name to the list? Hell yeah! I know that there'll be time, but I okay. want to at least make the intention. Oh, we're going to make time. <laughs> you want to at least the attention. Intention, not that. <laughs> okay. Okay. And did your name enter as an A or an O? I, oh. O. Oh. oh, perfect. I know, like, it starts with Willie, because that's what I, or no, I know it starts with P, because that's what I typed in the <laughs> email bar, right? And then the rest of it, so perfect. Okay. Did anyone else want to sign up? Oh, well, we've got time. Okay. Beauty. Then we will go to 
by two. No, we'll go, yeah, we'll go two by two. Okay, so our first two open mic readers tonight are Virginia Beichman. Oh my god, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and Timothy Patterson. Oh, are you okay being recorded? Yeah, of course. Perfect.
challenge. <laughs> That's good. But again, we don't want to draw attention to ourselves. A nice, you know why, baby seat. We like to use baby wipes. And that's <laughs> the most important thing to bring yourself and love. But also help the sturdy shovel. <laughs> I will bring the drink. A black cat, and he won't stop bothering me. Roses, <laughs> his favorite. A blanket. And an extremely suspicious suitcase. <laughs> there is nothing except latex gloves and shoes you can dispose of. <laughs> my love, my heart pounds at the mere thought of us in that cemetery committing sins against God and man life. Possibly this weird cat as well. <laughs> Write back soon, and please check the envelope, enclosed with something of me, for you, to help you bide your time until we meet again. Sincerely, yours, in this life and the next. <laughs> just for fun. Some thoughts on Red Riding Hood in honor of Professor Shannon Bates. <laughs> My earliest memory of Little Red was a cheesy stop-motion movie short filmed somewhere between 1940 and 1960. This version, Grandma was locked away and the hunter shot after the wolf when the crook and canine dashed off. It's weird they censored the supposed death of a bad wolf. That version was most likely inspired by the writer Charles Perrault, a Frenchman who kept things family friendly. Unlike the Grimm brothers who swung by and snatched up the story and stuff it with violence that make modern art movies look tame, a typical trademark of their style of storytelling. I often wonder if German kids were made of harder stuff back then. <laughs> anyway, my patient pondering led me to a number of random thoughts. First. Little Red can't smell. Seriously, I hypothesize that Red lost her ability to smell as a young child because when she encounters the wolf disguised as Grandma, she doesn't take one sniff of wolf musk and sprint away for help. <laughs> Has anyone smelled a canine before? They reek. She wouldn't have gone through that weird checklist of, what big eyes you have, and on and on if she got one whiff of that wolf. Second, why, why, why did that wolf go through such effort to gobble down that little girl in the contents of her basket when he could have laid low amongst the bushes and leapt out, crushing her delicate throat, dark ruby blood staining her lipstick red hoodie a darker tone. <laughs> then he could drag her away and the basket, too, from the forest path and feast without care on her flesh and, according to some versions of the story, wash her down with wine and cake, meant for her sickly grandma. How sugar would ease a sick old lady doesn't make sense, or alcohol. Or even if you wanted to still run ahead to the old lady's cottage and set up the ambush there, wouldn't gulping down grandma make no room for red or her food? And when could a wolf unhinge its jaws like a snake to shove that poor old lady down his throat into his moist, acidic stomach until a hunter performs a C-section to get her out? Wild, mind you, he's asleep or awake, in which he'd bleed out to death. Anyway, I researched how such a story came about, meaning I just read Wikipedia, because I'm not in college anymore, so I can reference it. <laughs> Some sources say this story came from the medieval fear of Mother Nature and what she supplied inside her deep, dark forests of Europe. Another lesson reminds us to obey our mothers. Red's mom had scolded her to remain on the path, I think a better lesson is to not tell a stranger where you're going, or don't walk through the forest alone, page of advice that survives today, or how crazy life can get even when you follow the rules to a T, or don't talk to animals, don't talk even if it's a freaking wolf. So to wrap it up, uh, my thoughts, if this story was set in today's world, it would go like this. Little Red would tepity tap on her smartphone to summon a delivery drone to get that food to Grandma, kick it back on the couch with some popcorn, switch on Amazon Prime, and rent she's the man. <laughs> <laughs>
say? Okay, just make an eye contact and we're good. <laughs> then, our final two readers for the evening will be uh, myself and then our patron saint from the Utah Humanities, Willie Paloma. Mm -hmm. So, tonight I will read a poem. I know it went through poetry at three earlier this year. Um, it's titled Gratitude, a Prayer. And this poem got, became, it was a semi finalist in uh, the Red Wheelbarrow competition. Mm -hmm. And so it got in front of Mark Doty. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. He didn't like it, though. It didn't make it to that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't become a finalist or a winner. But he still read it, and that's yeah, pretty cool. Uh -huh. <laughs> Gratitude, a prayer. My grandmother shit herself at the department store waiting for me to get back with an associate with the bathroom code. She whimpered my name as thick shit slid down her loose pant leg. Thank God I took her shopping that day, not the neighbor, not my father. Thank God for linoleum and tile and the alcove in the back of the store away from other shoppers. Thank God for the associate who said nothing when she rounded the corner and saw the yellow-brown puddle. Thank God the store sold wet wipes. Thank God she had spare pants and underwear, carried them around in her purse. Thank God my sister came with us, gagging but ferrying in and out of the women's restroom. Thank God for the woman and her toddler who came and went without a word about the sour squash smell. Thank God for toilet seat covers, better than paper towels because they were flushable. Mm. Thank God the sinks had actual handles and not sensors so I could flush her shoes with hot water, watching toilet paper stick to shit stuck to her naked heel under the stall door. Thank God the handicapped stall was empty. Thank God again for wet wipes with which I gently erased my grandmother's insides from the toilets outside. Mm. Thank God for whoever held my gag reflex as I bent to the ground and did what was before me to be done, scooping the soft earth of my grandmother. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Like the gag reflex, like is involuntary. I was like, oh, this is actually much harder to do 